Okay, hey everyone, thank you for joining us for this week's Webinar Wednesday. So we're trying to do at least once a month, do a webinar that is on different sales topics as opposed to just bringing you guys new solutions. And <clears throat> I did a little bit of research. I don't know if you guys saw my last blog that I did where I was looking at some of the trends that are coming up for the next decade for in sales reps so that you guys know where to focus your attention so that you can start building on some programs that maybe are gonna have some longevity. And in doing the research, I was able to find some statistics on independent medical sales reps. And it's about um, the top 5% or so earn in that $25,000 a month range, which is $300,000 a year. So I thought this would be a good time to maybe talk to some of the sales reps who are earning that type of income or more, which we have a handful of them that use the Every Ancillary platform. I'm learning from them too, guys, because I go out in the field too. As you can see, sometimes I actually put on a collared shirt. Once in a while I shave, and I still go out in the field. I still have my clients. And so I'm learning from these guys too to see how I can start increasing my earning potential as an independent rep, because that's why we got in this. So I'm going to cover just some of the topics and, and some of the themes that I heard from these different sales reps that I had spoken to, uh, just to see what their philosophy is. So first and foremost, I wanted to talk about what the future looks like for independent medical sales reps. This is a great field. This is a fast changing market with a lot of innovation. And the cool thing about being in our position is that a lot of the companies who get into the medical space, there's a lot of small startups. They don't have huge budgets to invest in a W2 sales force and put millions of dollars into corporate sales training programs. So a lot of these companies rely on using 10 reps. And so for better or for worse, I'm gonna go ahead and mute you guys out there. So for better or for worse, there's gonna be a lot of opportunities as we <clears throat> get deeper into uh, the 2020s. I can't believe I'm saying that. But there's going to be a, a lot of innovation that you guys are going to see that you're going to have an opportunity to participate from a marketing standpoint and potentially earn some great money. So the way I look at this, if you're a 1099, you're basically in, you own your own sales business. You are a medical sales consulting company. Even if you're just a one man uh, or, or woman shop, you own your own business. So you have to treat this like a business. Statistics I found, even though about the top 5% of earners who are independent medical sales reps earn over $300,000 a year, the national average is $89,000 a year, which I guess to maybe the average person sounds okay, but if you've worked in medical sales, I mean, that was my salary got close to 20 years ago, um, when I was still in my 20s, that was the starting base salary was around there. So there is a ton of opportunity, but there obviously are people that still struggle, although I think part of that number has to do with there's people who are maybe getting a foothold into medical sales, this is a way to get into it, or people that need to work more flexible schedules and are not doing it full time. But suffice to say, there is a, a lot of room to make good money, if not great money, as an independent rep. If you guys could mute yourselves out, let me go ahead and... Okay, please don't unmute yourself if you can help it. So just some of the growth, fact, uh, growth sectors that we had blogged about recently, these are some of the sectors that we see have huge potential over the next decade. Number one being regenerative medicine. I found different statistics on this, but the most reliable publication I saw, I read it in medical economics somewhere. They estimate that the growth of the regenerative market is close to 500% by the year 2030. So uh, I've joked around with other people about this. You could have been a subpar mediocre Bitcoin broker for the last 10 years. You would still be filthy rich today. So if you can get on to, uh, get into programs that have a huge growth traje trajectory like regenerative medicine, the things in particular that I'm focused on are things like bioidentical hormone replacement, liquid amnion. We've had Alyssa Flores on a bunch of times. She also is bringing on exosomes. 
but all of those things are these are areas that more and more patients are becoming aware of these treatments. They're requesting these treatments. Doctors like to do these things anyway because it gives them a cash pay option and they can diversify out of just being strictly insurance based. The other area of focus is on precision medicine. You might see some areas, uh, opportunities pop up for independent reps here as well. I know big pharma is expected to go into more of a niche market where it's customized medications for each person. We also see this with risk assessment tests. So I would count this as precision medicine. We had on Premier Labs as an example recently. Premier Labs has some specialty panels like the diabetes risk assessment panel. Those types of um, risk panels that look for different polymorphisms that can identify patients early where those early identifications to better intervention and better treatment for the patient. There's going to be a huge future there. Of course, well-being programs. They estimate that 60% of healthcare dollars will be spent on well-being programs. We're already seeing that with programs like the osteoarthritis injections. There's a lot of primary care doctors who are getting involved in that. It makes them great revenue. But number two, it's about seven out of 10 patients avoid or delay surgery, and it's more likely to be done if a primary care doctor offers it. So programs like that, other programs that address chronic conditions like our diabetes care MD, allergy, there's a bunch more, uh, neurocognitive assessments, things like that. Anything that are about early assessment, treatment, and prevention, there's going to be a huge focus on that. And then, of course, anything that's remote. This market was already expected to expand, but due to COVID, the demand has increased substantially. I just read about 70% of doctors are looking for additional services that they can uh, build through telehealth. So doctors are getting used to it. Patients prefer it. It's a winner. So anything you can find that is billable under telehealth. We just saw things like, of course, you have things like remote patient monitoring, chronic care management, behavioral health integration, but things like medical weight loss, for instance, those weight loss counseling codes are now, are now billable through CMS as a telehealth visit. And it's expected that there's going to be more and more treatments and types of visits that are going to be covered as telehealth visits. So now let me get into some of the feedback that I got from some of the people that I spoke with who are performing at the highest level. And number one, I wanted to get into their mind and find what, what is your mindset as you uh, approach your career and, uh, and, and look at your year 2021. Number one thing that people told me is they set a goal for themselves, monthly goal, weekly goal, annual goal. Write it down somewhere, even if it's on, just on a slip of paper and you put it in your desk. Uh, just something to hold yourself accountable. The other thing that should be encouraging to anybody who's maybe not performing at the highest level, who wants to perform at the highest level, is that the highest earners, on average, they work with six clinics. So this isn't like you have to get half of the country working with you on a, on a particular service to make money. Usually it's in that range. Five or six really good customers can make you a great living. So if you think about it, that's about $4,000 average per clinic. If you can do that through a mix of different services, then you're on pace to make that, that type of $300,000 a year or more. The other advice I got is that the top performers, they become an expert in one area. We have a huge portfolio. Obviously, we are basically a marketplace for medical ancillaries, but that doesn't mean you guys need to sell the entire book. A lot of the people who are really great at this, who are making the most money, when I talk to them, they have one particular area of focus. Well, what are you doing, Rick? Well, what I'm doing is all I do is focus on osteoarthritis injections. So I make money off the capital equipment purchase. And then, of course, we hit them with the, um, uh, with the liquid amnion, and they get a recurring source of revenue from the amnio injections. And then there are some things that are tangential to that, and they start adding on those other pieces. You could become an expert in something like diabetes or um, uh, mental health, or there's all sorts of things that you, you could become an expert in. If you become an expert in diabetes, you have lab tests, specialty lab tests you can order, genetic tests, maintenance panels. You have tons of equipment that you can sell. And 
these programs are modular, so you can add and subtract programs. And getting up to that $4,000 a month per clinic is pretty easy, actually, if you have the right mix of products and if you position it right. So just think of one area that you want to focus in and just find the programs that support that, that particular focus. The way I think about this, someone told this to me, and I thought this was brilliant. They go in with the mindset of ancillaries solve problems. I'm a practice development manager, which means I'm an expert in ancillaries. If so facto, I'm here to solve problems. That's what medical ancillaries do. Whatever problems a practice might be having. Oh, we don't have enough revenue. Oh, we're not running efficiently. We don't have enough staff time. We're, um, we're not able to get patients to pay their co-pays. Our biller doesn't know how to bill X, Y, or Z. It doesn't matter what their problems are. There's something in your portfolio to help them. So if you just look at everything from a problem solver mindset, you're going to be successful. And then create daily habits. This is something I'm not trying to brag, but I'm pretty good about this. So I am very regimented. Anybody who knows me, my wife or other people who work with me, they could tell you at any time during the day, they could tell you exactly what I've probably already accomplished, what I have in front of me, because I have certain things that I do every single day. And once you do something for two or three weeks, it becomes a habit, and then it just becomes second nature. So create those daily habits that are going to lead you to success. And then don't take things personally. This is really tough to do, especially when you're an independent rep, uh, especially when you're in a field like medical sales, which, let's be honest, we hear no a heck of a lot more than we hear yes. So having that mindset of, of getting to those no's quickly is, is very important. And when you have somebody that's rude to you or you get a no when you thought you might get a yes, just don't take it personally. You, you don't know what's actually going on with that practice. You don't really know the reasons behind it. But don't think it always has something to do with you. And, and the other piece of advice, this is something I've always followed too. Like you might feel like, okay, I haven't achieved my goals yet. I've been doing this a year. I've been doing it two years. I'm still kind of muddling through and just barely getting by. And I know people who are in that camp too. As long as you have your a, in a plan, you set a goal and you create some action plans, you really only, you're only a failure when you give up. At that point, you're a failure. And until then, you're working toward a goal. So just have that mindset and just be kind to yourself. Okay, so now getting into the nitty gritty. How do the top performers prospect? Multi-channel engagement. I talked about this in that sales playbook. I know a lot of you read that, but especially in today's day and age, practices are more accustomed to dealing with sales reps in all manner of uh, engagement. So that means not just knocking on doors, going to the front desk, handing your business card and a flyer to the gatekeeper. That means reaching out through other channels. So that could mean like joining associations. That means, <clears throat> excuse me, that means emailing. That means participating on their social media. A lot of practices have their own social media sites set up. I know somebody who is very successful, one of the people I spoke to, and they said how they've gotten a lot of their doctors is they start following them, their social media pages, Twitter or mostly Facebook, even Instagram, and they participate a lot. They give them hearts, they give them comments, they make nice comments. Well, two, three months later, they'll go back and start to hit those, those prospects up and they basically soften them up. So that's, that's just one example. Uh, find allies in the field. This is something that is my uh, from my own experience, I've had a lot of success with this. Some of the best accounts I've gotten through the years have been because I was able to make a connection to somebody else who works in the field. I don't know how many times I've been in and out of an office and you see another sales rep who's sitting in there and they're waiting to talk to the doctor and maybe a tiptoe out of there because you don't want to step on, uh, you don't want to uh, encroach on them. Or you see somebody walking out of an office. Don't look at those people as threats. Chances are, very high that they're not selling anything that competes with what you're selling. Occasionally that happens, but most of the time you're not talking to a competitor. You're just talking to another sales rep who's probably bringing some other solution. Get in the habit of engaging with those people and talking to those people. Hey, how you doing? Were you just in to see Dr. Smith? How did it go? Uh, commiserate with them. You, before you know it, I ended up making friends with a few people who I just started conversations in a lobby or in um, a waiting room or, or what have you. And before you know it, you find areas where 
maybe they have uh, softened up some prospects or maybe they're, they're working with some clients that you would love to get in with, but vice versa, you might have a couple good relationships that they would like to get in, uh, get into. So always go into it with a giving mindset. Don't go into it with the expectation of getting something out of it. But if you find some allies in the field and then you look for a way to help those allies. So I did that with this girl, Bridget. And I remember she ended up hooking me up with a great account, but it started off with me hooking her up with a couple doctors who I already had relationships with. She told me what she was selling, and I said, oh, that's interesting. And then I started to think about it. I'm like, you know, have you ever talked to this one guy? And I mentioned the doctor. No, I never have. Where is he located? And then before you know it, we get into a conversation. And then before you know it, I emailed out an introduction, and then I got an email a week later. Thanks so much. I ended up doing a lunch, and uh, now we're working together on some stuff. And this stuff comes back around. Okay, ask for referrals. I can't tell you how important this is, but how few people do it. Asking for refer referrals is um, your your best way to get business because now you already have social proof. Doctors follow what other doctors do. They are not going to do something on your recommendation. They're going to do something on recommendations from their peers. So make sure, if even if you're just working with one client, that's really all you need is one client. If you work with one client and you give it your all and you're really attentive to that client, once you've established good rapport with that client, it's pretty easy to ask them for if they have any colleagues that they think would benefit from your services. Hey, look, Doc, I, I work on commission. I'm not going to lie. I work on commission, but you can see I work really hard for you. I've been able to add value. Do you have any of your colleagues that you think would uh, benefit from the services that I'm bringing? And I'm telling you it works. I've gotten a lot of referrals for the year through the years, and this will save you from having to continually prospect and knock on doors, which is no fun. I already mentioned this, but join associations. When I worked in the dental field, I joined this uh, dental society for my county and ended up getting a lot of great contacts from that and ended up getting some great accounts. The other cool thing is a lot of times they do small events, continuing medical education. So you could look for certain niche areas you might be working in. Like we have Alyssa coming on next week, I believe, to talk about wound care as an example. Well, you could, you could take what she has and look up some podiatry medical associations. I think I used to pay only maybe four or $500 to get a table in the back of a room. And this might have 40, 50 dentists there. They do a dinner, they have a couple talks, and the doctors earn three or four continuing education credits. Same thing in, in these other specialties. And there's usually not a lot of competition there. It's a lot more intimate. And you end up having a lot of engaging conversations. And I thought I got way more out of doing those than I ever did doing the big massive trade shows that cost thousands of dollars. And you're dealing with the doctor from Timbuktu. These are all doctors who are going to be local to you. So think about, look for some associations and see if you can join those. Uh, the other thing, I mentioned this in my playbook, but this is something... I'm not going to say I'm the master at it, but I'm telling you, this is a technique that I've learned. I learned it from somebody else, but I've adopted it, and it's served me pretty well in my career, which is to just ask for help. A lot of times, the, the number one thing that people ask me about um, in terms of needing help with getting started with practices is how do I get past that darn gatekeeper? It's always a headache. Well, instead of thinking about gatekeepers as someone to get past, think about what their role is in the practice, number one. And when you think about what their role is, which is basically to protect the doctor's time, if you can approach them that way and, and, and let them know, hey, look, I understand what your role is. This is what your role is. Usually they'll nod in agreement. And then you can tell them, but I have something here that I think your doctor is really going to want to see. This is really going to benefit your patients because of X, Y, and Z. This is going to benefit your practice. And you just sell the benefits. I'm sure you guys have seen that movie, uh, Tommy Boy. Um, you don't sell the steak, you sell the sizzle. Talking to the gatekeepers, you don't talk about what your, the, the nuts and bolts of whatever program you're promoting. You talk about the benefits. We have something that's going to reduce um, uh, patients' incidence of uh, getting type 2 diabetes by 12%. We have something that's going to address a specific program. If you were in my shoes, what would you do? How would you get to the doctor? What would you recommend? Is there any way you can help me out? I know I'm just barging in here and you guys are busy. I'm coming in the middle of your day. I didn't expect to come in here and just talk to your doctor. But do you think you can help me? Uh, if you were in my shoes, what would you do? I always ask that. 
Well, I guess if I were in your shoes, I'd probably come back on Thursday mornings. Well, why? Well, because the doctor doesn't see patients on Thursday morning. They're usually just doing paperwork or continuing it or whatever. That's usually a good time to come in. You're, you're, okay, so if I come in next Thursday, do you think you can help me get five minutes? You'd be surprised how often, it doesn't work with everybody, but a lot of people are comp compelled to help just because you asked for help. Okay, and then lay the groundwork for some big accounts. Some of the people who are really successful, they got successful because they managed to get big, huge accounts. Easier said than done, and not everything in the ancillary space is going to work. But there are some people that have contracts with big hospital systems or physician groups or even like county or state health boards or associations, county hospitals. And if you could find some things that might work for, it, uh, for those types of accounts, it, it's a long sale. It's bureaucratic. And most people stay away for that reason. But what I found is some of these people who are doing well, they went through all the bureaucracy for the last four to six months and laid the groundwork. Meanwhile, they have other accounts going. And before you know it, they're a preferred provider or they're, they're on the procurement system and they're able to fill orders for various things. So, so dedicate maybe a small per percentage of your week, five or 10%, to going after those whales. You may not get them, but the only way you are going to get them is to start laying the groundwork now. So maybe by Q3, Q4, you're actually getting some orders from these guys. And then last is go virtual. There's a lot more reps. I would say, I don't have any hard statistics on this, but at least half of you I know are working virtually at least part of the time. And that was as, due to COVID, but even post COVID, I think a lot of people on the sales side, but also from the customer side, they're used to doing things virtually now. So you can do a lot more over the phone, email, Zoom calls, you name it, than you think. And so the beauty of this is that you're not limited to your local market. You can start to market to go a little bit outside your market or even way outside your market into other states, et cetera. Okay, now how do you make that sale? This is what everyone wants to know. Well, number one, you got a pre-call plan. you got to do your research. You don't just walk in and wonder, I wonder what the heck this practice does. I'm bringing in my catalog. i got 40 services. Well, what do you guys do here? You should know that before you go into a practice. Every, every customer has a website now. They're going to tell you exactly what their scope is, any additional services that they're doing. It's almost always going to be on their website. Um, if you've already been to a practice, your first visit your first one or two visits is usually just to gather information, find out what the rules of the practice are, what they're already doing, how do they engage with reps, so that you can formulate your pre-call plan. When I was in pharma, pre-call plan, pre-call plan, pre-call plan, that's all they teach you. Pre-call plan basically means you got a plan for when you're walking in there. Okay, I know where they're at. I know where I want to take them by the end of the call. I know what I want to accomplish. Sometimes that pre-call plan could be something really simple like, Look, I just want to find out who is the office manager, what's the best way to approach them. It may not even be to get to the office manager, but make sure you do your research, make sure you have a plan, and have a goal for each, uh, for each interaction that you have with the practice. Find complimentary programs. So I'm going to share with you guys a gift at the end here, and I think you guys are, are going to like this. I made, made this real simple for you to find, what, um, to find good programs on the fly. So you can always pivot, but find compliments. So if I go into a practice and I see that they're offering like, um, boy, it could be anything. Maybe I see like a Stericycle um, uh, box in there. So they're using Stericycle for medical waste. Well, that's not like a big ticket thing. But if I see Steris, oh, this isn't a compliment. That would be a competitor. Okay, I scratched that. Maybe you find that they're doing, um, uh, uh, injections or something, uh, guided injections. Well, you could find, well, um, you know, we have uh, uh, amniotic fluid that has an approved Q code. That would complement the injections that they're already doing. Or they're already doing, like, uh, a lot of diabetes treatments. Well, you're missing a couple of the diagnostic tools that could help you get a, do a further analysis on the patient, establish a baseline, get a, a clearer picture of their health, and not to mention generate a lot of extra revenue. So you might look for things like a max pulse or an electronic tuning fork or a TM flow, or maybe it's MD Diabetic Pro, the lab test. There's always compliments you can 
uh, you can enhance what they're already doing. And that's an easy way to make a sale to say, oh, I see you're already doing X, Y, and Z. Those are great programs. We can add this one thing to it, and it's going to complement all those things that are all going to grow together. Usually find a willing audience. I won't spend too much time on this, but be respectful of the doctor and staff. That goes without saying. Start with a positive comment. I actually read this. This is an interesting phenomenon, that if you start a conversation with a positive comment, they did a study with waiters and waitresses and found that if they, their first thing out of their mouth was something positive, like, oh, did you see the local team just won a game? Or, um, oh, I heard it's going to be beautiful out this weekend. Like something that is, creates a sense of um, being positive, their tips increased by 27% just by starting their conversation out with a positive comment. So you want to create a positive energy when you're in a practice. You want to be a positive person. You want to bring positive energy. That starts with having some kind of positive comment. Even if it's like what I usually do is I just say something positive about the practice, especially if they have a nice building or they, they have a, um, a nice office space or just something you can find to be positive. That's always good. Create emotion. How you create emotion is through telling stories. So telling a doctor about the features and benefits of uh, how this diabetes program is going to help, um, is going to enhance patient care and overall you're going to reduce diabetes by this amount, that's not going to create emotion. What creates emotion is talking to your doctor about another practice that used the service. And let me tell you about the patient, Nancy. So we had a patient, this doctor had a patient, Nancy. This patient had a non-healing wound for over a year. They tried everything. They did different debridement. You know, they tried these different treatments. They could not uh, get this, this wound to heal. And this patient was in danger of amputation. They were within probably a month of amputation. Well, we were able to try this new type of autologous skin. And wouldn't you know it? And then you tell them the rest of the story. Stories are what creates emotion. And then people fill in the gaps with logic. People buy stuff because they feel like they want to buy it, not because they're, they're weighing all the pros and cons in their head. They weigh the pros and cons only to justify their emotions. Uh, listen and ask lots of questions. So when you go into a practice, you should not be thinking about, I want to talk to the doctor and I want to bring up these 10 points. You should have questions ready. Any good sales pitch involves asking lots of questions. How are you currently treating patients who have X? What do you do when this happens with the patient? What, do you, well, what is the next step if the patient does not respond to that? Um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you find in your practice? What are, um, where do you see medical ancillaries fitting in your practice? What problems do you hope medical ancillaries will solve for you? Listen, and then if the doctor knows you're listening, the practice manager knows you're listening, when you come up with a solution, then they're going to be a lot more willing to listen to you because they know that you're addressing the problems that they're telling you about. Have a single call to action. This can be a tough part. I understand that one of the drawbacks of every ancillary and the way that we sell is that we have a whole portfolio of products and services. But guess what? You're not the only one. What do you think uh, a Henry Schein rep or a Marisource Bergen or um, Patterson, any of these big companies that sell multiple pro, uh, products and services, they're able to carry a full portfolio of, of products and services. But I know, like I worked, I mentioned I worked in the dental field for a while. We had a big menu of things that we could do for, doc, for dentists. But when I go, would go out and sell, you have to go out with a singular mindset. So that could be different for each practice, but you want to have one single call to action. So at the, by the end of the call, you want to get to just one thing. You don't want to say, okay, doc, I'm going to come back and I'm going to bring you six different contracts and we're going to get these six programs going. That's never going to work. You have to boil it down to one single thing that you want to accomplish. And then finally, end on a high note. There was another study that was done for colonoscopy clinics. And they, I don't remember what they did, but at the end of the colonoscopy, they would um, give patient surveys. And of course, colonoscopy is not a pleasant procedure. But they would give them a, um, they would give them basically a survey to find out, you know, what their experience was like. And of course, you're going to get poor or mixed results just because the nature of a colonoscopy is not that pleasant. But what they started doing was doing something at the end for the last minute that was pleasant. 
kind of like if you ever done yoga, you do that shavasana at the end, you know, where you're just basically laying down and for the last couple minutes, and it's pleasant. If you end on a high note and do something, maybe it's like, okay, at the end of your colonoscopy, you're going to go over and you're going to sit in that massage chair for a minute, and then that was the end of it. Well, the rate, the uh, surveys that they got were way, way higher when they ended those colonoscopies on a one-minute high note, basically. So you want to end with, just like you're starting your presentation with something positive, you want to end on a high note and end with something positive as well. This is something, I pulled this actually from that Grant Cardone. If you guys don't know him, he's got a big YouTube channel. He's like a sales guru. He's real big on writing up your deal, and I've been guilty of not doing this too. What we mean by write up the deal is, I see this happen all the time, and, and trust me, I'm just as guilty. You have these great conversations, maybe with the doctor, yeah, we, we may go forward. You need to put something in front of them that's going to make them make a decision. So it, whether it's a contract, sign-up form, something, don't be afraid to put that in front of them. And a lot of times what I do, especially if it's just something like, let's say you want to get them going with um, – MD Diabetic Pro. You have a practice that's, that sees a lot of diabetic, pre-diabetic patients. Okay, we're, we want to get you started on this, this specialty panel. I would have that sheet ready to go, the sign-up form, and start filling it out. Leave as little up to them as they possibly need to do. Doc, all I need is your MPI number. I need your DEA number. I need your signature here. Everything else I have filled out. But get that in front of them. That at least gets the sale a little bit further. You're much more likely to close the business if you write up your write up your deal. And then finally, we talk about this all the time. You guys already know this, but I can't say it enough because I heard this from every top performer. Money is in the follow-up. It takes five to eight touches to get a close. doesn't matter what you're selling. That's the average, five to eight touches. So just know when you walked into that practice and they were kind of interested and you got a meeting and then the second time you were over there, you had a great conversation with the doctor about this program. Then you went over there a third time. They're even more excited, but you still don't have, well, where's the deal? Why didn't the doctor sign it? And you get frustrated and whatever happened to that? I don't know. I went back there a few times. You got to keep going back. I always say this, but I think, sub, I think this is true. Subconsciously, I feel like doctors are sizing us up as practice development managers, reps, whatever you want to call yourself. They're sizing up the program, but they're also sizing you up to see how diligent you are. Are you someone that is trustworthy? And just by doing things like telling the doctor you're going to come back every week and showing up at that time every week, you end up wearing some of them down, and they see that you're a serious person that they can count on. That's really what it, it comes down to. And plus, they're so busy with, with other things and other sales reps that are coming in. It's easy for your program that they might be excited about to kind of fall down the ladder in terms of their level of uh, importance of what they want to get to. And before you know it, they got 10 other things stacked on top of it on their desk. The only way you're going to keep that up at the top of that their stack of things to look at is to keep going in and bugging them calling them up and bugging them, doing whatever you need to do till you either get a yes or a no. A no is fine. The quicker you get to a no, the better. It can help you focus on other people. But uh, just keep in mind, it's five to eight touches on average, and sometimes it's more than that. Just some additional tips that I had heard that might be useful. One is you have to train constantly. So the reason that we make those videos and we have that YouTube channel is so that you can train with basically click notes. If you guys were lazy students like I was, I looked for any shortcut I could get. So I create those explainer videos because they're all three to five minutes in length. So if you are going into a practice and, uh, or you're focused in a particular area and you need a refresher, but there's six, eight, ten different programs you have to know about, well, we made it real easy where you can basically condense that down to, you know, 30 minutes or an hour uh, once a week or once every other week and just keep yourself fresh. Also, dress the part. It's better to overdress than underdress. I, I, do, I just went out in the field um, uh, a couple weeks ago with, with one of our vendors who was in town, and um, I will tell you that, like, I just decided I'm going to overdress a little bit, and I wore, like, a full suit and everything, and I live in Southern California. This isn't, like, a suit and tie place typically, but I felt when I was going into that practice and I had, and this is a doctor I already knew, but I hadn't seen in a while, but I'm telling you, the mindset for me and the energy I got from them was different. I felt more confident. I felt that they took me a little bit more seriously. So 
Don't be afraid to overdress and be confident. But how you're confident is by following those first two points. You can't be confident without training. If you're confident and you haven't trained, that's just false bravado. You're a fool. If you don't know what you're talking about, doctors, practices, they're going to suss that out pretty quick, and they're not going to take you seriously about this or anything else you bring them in the future. So only talk about what you really know about. But if you've trained on it and you feel confident, then uh, that's going to come across. They're a lot more likely to work with you. And, of course, dressing the part, that also ties into, into your confidence. Be efficient. Use CRM. Take notes. Of course. The, the best performers that I've seen, a lot of them are, I, I think you'd be surprised. There's some people who are great salespeople who I talk to. Then there's some other people that I've spoken to who I know make great money. And no offense to them, but they're a little bit more milk toast, and they're maybe not the greatest sales uh, salesperson. They're not like the most gregarious people, but they're diligent, and they just put their nose to the grindstone. So I've told these stories a million times about my use of CRM, but I'm telling you, just keeping notes in your CRM, it takes a little bit of discipline, but that gets back to the uh, mindset. Create daily habits. One of your daily habits should be to use a CRM. I've told this a million times, but like what my habit has always been when I am out in the field, every practice has an appointment card or a business card at the front. Before I've even talked to them, I'm reaching over, I'm grabbing that business card, and I hold it in one hand. Because when I walk out of that office, I feverishly write down every note I can think of, even down to the smallest detail. I write that down in the back of the business card, and then I'm, poof, I forget about it. At night, after I've made my sales calls, I log everything into my CRM, and that's my reminder. I go through all my business cards, and then I make an action plan. Okay, well, I should follow up with these people in one week. These people want to see a study on this. This is how you create your plan. But really, most of success is just showing up, and you'll be surprised how many times you get into conversations with, with practices, and you're able to remind them of, well, you know, I actually was in here on June 11th, and it looks like I talked to you about this, and then I came back on June 25th, and you mentioned this. And once they know that you're on top of it, again, it creates, it creates uh, trust that you, you are a serious professional that they should take seriously. There is a uh, book by Jonathan Haidt called Thinking Fast and Slow. This is kind of where I got this, but uh, this is how I always thought about it, thinking slow on nights and weekends. So what, <laughs> what my, the way that I set my days and weeks up is that during the week, I actually am more working on instinct. I'm not sitting back writing blogs. I'm not sitting back doing plans during the, during the work week. These practices are only open certain hours. What you do is on nights and weekends, that's when you do your slow thinking. That's when you start to think of the big picture and what you need to do, and then you think of all the action steps that you need to do. Once it hits Monday morning, I trust that I did good thinking over the weekend and at night so that come Monday morning, I'm just following my list, and I know that if I just put my head down and, and do everything on my list, at the end of the week when I pull my head up, I will have made 45 sales calls. I will have done these follow-ups. I will have done all these different action steps that I gave myself. So think slow on the nights and weekends. Think fast during the week. Keep your word even on the smallest things. I have seen, uh, I mean, we, we've had falling outs with people, and it's... <laughs> Uh, just recently, I had a falling out with, with somebody, and it's just because I could tell they're BSing their way through some stuff, and that just is not going to work. It might be a way to get some short-term success, but you're never going to last in this business if you don't keep your word. That's even on the smallest things. Doc, I got a, a case study. I'm going to bring it back to you. Um, when's a good time? Can you bring it back by Friday? Yeah, I'll be back here Friday. And then Friday comes and goes, and maybe you got tied up with other stuff. You didn't call them, and uh, now you're afraid to go back in. Now you go in two weeks after. Um, you didn't keep your word. Make sure you keep your word, even on the little little small things. And this is a good way to establish trust, too, because the one thing I do is I give them my word on stuff they didn't even ask for. So if I'm talking to a practice and they're not giving me the time of day and they're giving you the usual hand-waving that gatekeepers tend to give you, sometimes they'll tell them, well, I'll tell you what, I'm going to be back in here next Tuesday morning. They didn't ask me for a commitment for anything, but I gave them my word anyway. And then when I write that on the back of that business card, and then I go home, and I write that in my CRM, and then I pull up my calendar, and a boom, I put them on my calendar. Come Tuesday morning, hey, Nancy, remember I said I'd be back next Tuesday? Well, this is next Tuesday. I'm back. 
And before you know it, you start to be known as uh, maybe they, they might need your service, they might not, but if they do, they're going to be thinking of you because they're thinking of you as being a reliable person. And finally, don't get too high or too low. Like I said, the, the ancillary space is, I, I love this space because it's constantly changing, but that's also one of the drawbacks of it is that you always have new technologies coming out, you have patents that expire, you have vendors that go out of business, you just have things that happen. That's why it's good to carry a whole basket of things and be a practice development manager so you're not tied to one single thing. But the downside of that is that when you, um, even though it can be exciting learning new things and there's always going to be new opportunities to make more money and uh, to provide more services, the problem with that can be uh, sometimes you get the rug pulled out from under you. And anybody who is on this call who's been in this space for, I'd say, any longer than two years, I bet you right now you're nodding in agreement. You've had some program that was on easy street, that you were making great money, then all of a sudden, oh, Medicare changed the billing guidelines, or oh, this business got, uh, the company I was working with got bought out by another company and they're not honoring their 1099 contracts, or who knows? I mean, things happen. You have to be ready to pivot, and you can't get too high or too low when those things happen. Just know that that is, happens to everybody, and it's just part of the game. Okay, finally, I just wanted to share with you a little, how am I doing? Oh, my God, 42 minutes. I tried to get this done in 30, way over. I wanted to share with you a little gift. This is something that I just put together, and I think you guys will find this helpful. Now, if you guys get our catalogs, you've probably seen we include a practice questionnaire in the back. Well, we've revamped this practice questionnaire. Let me see if I can zoom this so you can see it a little better. We have this now broken into three sections. Again, the one thing I want to stress, as you can see on the top here, ancillary programs solve problems. You are an expert in ancillary programs. Therefore, you solve problems. If you can get that through to your clients, like I said, the beauty is that you don't need to get everybody in town. You really only need one good one to start, but your goal should be to build it up to five or six practices where you're their guy for ancillaries. That's what you want to be. So we have this new questionnaire. I'm going to email this out along with this recording. So anybody on here, you're welcome to, to get it, but I, I improved on this quite a bit. I think you guys will like it. So number one, we, uh, we are going to use this uh, questionnaire to narrow in on something that's going to be right in the sweet spot of the practice. Not something that they don't really need, not something that may fit for these patients in this rare occasion. No. I'm here to just help you solve problems and show you stuff that's going to be right in your sweet spot to solve those problems. So you can cut out all the noise. So it's broken into three sections. You have the demo, oops, Oop. hold on, sorry. You have the um, the practice demographics, just, you know, finding out their payer mix, all, all that kind of stuff. But then understanding what their goals are. What do they want to do? Do you want to, things that address COVID? Do you want to run your practice more efficiently? Are you looking for things for cash pay options? Are you looking at patients? What are your goals? And then below that, well, what are your criteria? Well, you hear that all the time. Well, I need something that works for this specialty, but... It has to have a high ROI, but I don't want to, um, uh, it has to be no cost or something. Okay, then this is the second page. This is what we added to it. This is our new matrix. This matrix, I know this looks really confusing, but you guys are going to love this, I'm telling you. What this matrix does is, oh, actually, I think I created an animation. Nope. No, I didn't. Okay, so this uh, matrix right here, this lists every single ancillary program that is in our, you know, this might be easier to pull it up here. Okay. Nope. Okay. This lists every single program that's on our platform presently. So I'll keep updating this every quarter. But you can see there's about 40 or so programs. And what this matrix goes along with the questionnaire. So you could look up here and see, well, um, I'm sorry, guys. What's your patient volume? And this lists if there's any specific patient volume needed, if there's space needed, and what the uh, uh, payer mix is for the practice, what specialties it goes with. And then if you follow this matrix over, you can see the actual vendors and what the services are. But then here it has all the goal questions. Does this program address physician burnout? Does this program address 
uh, saving time, adding efficiency, etc. Then you get into the criteria questions. Does this program work with telehealth? Does this program, you know, meet quality use measures or wh whatever it is? So this is it. This should be a really handy guide for you. So if you can just get them to fill out that first form, then what you're going to have is you basically turn over the, this is going to be on the back of the page, and then you can follow along with the matrix and easily pinpoint the vendors and the programs that are going to be in their sweet spot to help them that's going to meet their criteria, uh, meet their demographics, um, solve their, uh, meet their goals that they have within the criteria that they gave you. So you're never having to talk them into anything. You're always giving them stuff that they already told you that they want that's right in their sweet spot, and you're going to get right to the point without having to waste a bunch of time with, well, Doc, I know you said this doesn't really work for you, but, you know, in these situations, I used to do that when I was a drug rep. They, we had some doctors that were great prescribers, but then they would have you do stuff like, well, you need to go hit up all these doctors over here that really don't write our drug and, and try to tell them, well, you know, on this one plan, if you have any patients with United and if they're writing Lipitor, they should really start writing our drug because it's actually a little bit cheaper copay there. And it's like, well, that's a really tough sale. I would much rather go in with something that I know is going to be a smash hit with them and forget about all that other stuff. Okay, so with that, that is end of my presentation. I am, looks like I got a question here in the chat. I appreciate everyone's time and patience. Sean, thanks so much for the nice comment. I'll tell you what, I'm going to stop the recording.